Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Telemedicine Echo. My name is Beth Munson, and I work for Missouri Telehealth Network and Show Me Echo, Show Me Echo at the University of Missouri in Columbia. I am going to turn it over to our facilitator, Janine, and she's going to get us started now. Hi, Janine. Good morning. How is everyone on this beautiful April morning? The sun is shining, at least where I'm at. And um, we have been at this telemedicine echo for a year now. It's hard to believe, but a year ago um, in 2020, during the pandemic is when we began our telemedicine echo. So yay to all of you who have stuck in there with us um, and welcome to all the newbies uh, that are out here. I imagine we're gonna have people joining us as we uh, go along, but I just want to give you a warm uh, welcome and thank you uh, for joining us and making uh, this telemedicine echo what it's become. I'm Janine Gracie, director of the HTRC, and I have the honor to moderate these sessions. Before we get started, though, um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, MTN, who really put all of this together a year ago and has helped uh, organize this echo. So thank you to them. This is a joint effort to showcase uh, what is going on in telemedicine and to learn from each other about what's going on in telemedicine in our tri-state um, service area of Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma. And we will continue to address all things telemedicine. Uh, we are going to have another planning meeting to continue this uh, series and make sure that we are um, responding to your wants and needs. If you have ideas of speakers, if you have ideas of uh, topics that you would like to see uh, in the upcoming sessions, please um, let us know in the chat today and we'll take that under consideration when we meet and, and make the next um, calendar for the next few months. So we appreciate your feedback and certainly want to make this something that you get information out of and um, so that you can improve or enhance your telemedicine programs as we move along. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce the hub team and um, we would like for everyone in um, the echo today to uh, make sure that you put your own name and uh, the state next to your name. So while we're introducing the hub team, if you will, you can right click on your picture, hit rename and then place the state after your uh, name so that we can answer questions according to your state. Um, you know, all states are a little bit different when we're talking about some reimbursement issues and that type of thing. So let's make sure that we're able to do that with you as we move forward. So hub team members, let's get started with uh, Karen. Good morning, everybody. I'm Karen Edison. I'm the Senior Medical Director of the Missouri Telehealth Network and our Show Me Echo program. Thank you, Karen. Excellent. Rachel. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rachel Mutro. I'm the Senior Program Director for the Missouri Telehealth Network and Show Me Echo program, and I'm the state uh, lead for this Heartland Telehealth Resource Center project. Excellent. Thank you, Rachel. Tim. Good morning, uh, Tim Davis, uh, Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences Telehealth Manager and the HCRC Oklahoma representative. Wonderful, Heather. Good morning, everyone. My name is Heather Hagen. I'm a telehealth analyst at OSU CHS. And Evelyn. Good morning, I'm Evelyn Nelson. I'm a psychologist at KU Med Center and PI for the Heartland. Telehealth Resource Center. Thank you. And Robert. Good morning. I'm Robert Stouts with KU School of Medicine, uh, Department of Pediatrics, and work with the Heartland Health Resource Center in Kansas. Wonderful. That. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a smaller than usual group today. So let's go ahead and have um, you all introduce yourselves quickly and uh, make sure that you give us your name, your position, and it looks like you all did a really good job with 
putting your state next to your name. So thank you for that. Uh, so let's start with um, Tarek. Hi, I'm Tarek, uh, University of Missouri St. Louis optometrist, um, teaching a new telehealth course. Excited to be with you. Thank you. Good to have you here. Uh, Trika. Good morning. Uh, Trika Young with Missouri Telehealth Network. I'm one of the outreach workers here. My role is to recruit participants for this ECHO. So I'm going to put my contact information in the chat. And if you have any leads for me, please email me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trika. Christy. Hi, I'm Christy Ganya from the University of Kansas Medical Center uh, Pediatrics Department, and I also work with the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. Thank you, Christy. Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarai Pereira. I'm a brand new uh, ECHO coordinator uh, working with in this office, and I'm just here to listen and learn, and I'm happy to be with you all this morning. That's great. Thanks. We're glad to have you, Sarah. Jerry? I'm Jerry Wilmus, physician uh, based in Maryville, Missouri, with uh, Mosaic Life Care in Northwest Missouri State University. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Jerry. He's one of our rock stars um, and actually did a, a wonderful video for us in terms of um, the benefits of ECHO. So that is, should be posted. Uh, on our website. Uh, so take a look at that and uh, invite your friends. Say, hey, listen to this and, and send the video link and invite your friends to join us. Hannah. So Janine, real quick, uh, appreciate the kind words, but I'm afraid you're going to lose credibility if you refer to me as a rock star and the interview was really great. So anybody <laughs> that watches it will say, are you sure you know what you're talking about? Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. We still think you're a rock star. <laughs> Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I work in Missouri with the Health Communication Research Center. And with that, I also work on communications with HTRC. So happy to be here. Wonderful. Good to have you here, Hannah. Barb. Barb Gleason, uh, project director for the Our Moms Boot Hill Perinatal Network grant in Southeast Missouri. Mm, good to have you here. Thank you, Barb. All right, Roma. Good morning. I'm Roma Heater, Quality Improvement Manager for um, ESRD Network 12. We work with um, Missouri, Nebraska, Kansas, and Iowa. Um, and we push out information um, to the dialysis clinics and transplant centers in the area. And I would love to take um, all this information and let them know what their, uh, what their possibilities are. Thanks for having me. Oh, great to have you here, Roma. Thank you so much. And Deborah. Hi, I'm a uh, St. Louis public school nurse. So I'm just learning, continue to learn. That's great. Thank you, Deborah. We're so happy that everyone's here today. Um, we will review a few little items about the ECHO. Um, we want to make sure that, um, you know, for a more collegial environment, we always use first names and echoes. If this is your first echo, we just use first names. Um, Please be conscious of any confidential or protected health information. If you have a question about a particular patient that you're working with, just make sure that you uh, protect that information. And if you have questions, you can always put them in the chat, but we'll have time for questions after. And if you have a question, raise your hand um, and then we'll call on you, uh, introduce yourself again, and ask your question. Uh, let's have everybody keep their microphones on mute uh, during the presentation, and we thank you for that. And all of these presentations and the information provided will be in box. Um, Beth would be happy to help you if you are not on box, if you need access to box, if you're having trouble with it, that type of thing, you make sure that you uh, work with Beth and she'll get you going on that. But there's a wealth of information in there and I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, I think with that, we are going to get started with the didactic. And today we have Donnie Parrish, who is the CIO 
of the Cherokee Nation Health Services, um, which is an award-winning organization um, in terms of what they have done with uh, their IT and telehealth. And I'm gonna let Donnie tell you all about that. So Donnie, it's your show now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Janine. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, excited to, to discuss telehealth. Uh, we have a real passion for it in our organization and, and um, really excited to, to have this discussion. Um, Dr. Jorge Mira, I know has participated in ECHO a few times and uh, this is my first go around. So uh, hopefully I'll, I'll do as well as he's been doing. I'll go ahead and get that presentation up. Just one second. Is everybody able to see the presentation? Yes. Um, and it'll just need to be in presentation mode. All right. <clears throat> there you go. It's perfect. Much better. All right. So my name is Donnie Parrish. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Cherokee Nation Health Services. Um, always like hearing a little bit about the speaker when, when uh, when someone's talking. So I was born and raised in Northeast Oklahoma. Uh, I'm from prior Oklahoma actually, and I, I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I'm proud graduate of Northeastern State University, which is in Tahlequah as well. It's a division two college. I had high hopes of being a pro football player. And I think the coaches had high hopes I would be bigger and faster. So <laughs> those, those things did not quite work out, but uh, I was lucky enough to uh, be in college during, you know, the uh, mid 90s of the dot com and, and boom of the internet and I jumped into some classes called telecommunications. And um, it has been a great part of my life ever since. I was lucky enough to work for some great organizations like WorldCom in Georgia Pacific uh, and, and then joined uh, my healthcare industry almost 20 years ago now, I can't, I can't believe it, uh, working for the Indian Health Service, a federal agency that um, assists tribes in providing healthcare. I didn't know much about it at the time. I, um, I had never been to private healthcare in my entire life until I was 24 years old. And I'd always been to a tribal or Indian health facility. So I really didn't know the difference and, and didn't have insurance. You know, there were so many different things. So I was very lucky uh, uh, to join Indian Health Services. And uh, in, the, in 2008, became a uh, employee and, and we changed our organization a little bit in Cherokee Nation. And we assumed control of the hospital that Indian Health had been running for us. So I have been the CIO now for 12 years and I cannot even begin to tell you how much change we've had. So. Um, I, let me give a little bit of information about Cherokee Nation for those of you that may not know much about us. Uh, we cover about 14 counties in Northeastern Oklahoma, about 7,000 square miles. Um, we have over a $2 billion economic impact to the state of Oklahoma annually, and, and, and that's growing. Uh, we have over 11,000 employees and uh, support over 20,000. Uh, some of this information is a little outdated, uh, but uh, it's good information to know. So we have about 250,000 Cherokee uh, citizens living in Oklahoma, almost 400,000 worldwide. Uh, we are the largest tribe in the United States and we have the largest healthcare system, uh, largest tribal healthcare system in the United States. So uh, we have about um, 11 facilities, including a 500,000 square foot clinic that we just completed last year. It's kind of our shining star. We're very proud of it. it everybody calls it the hospital because it's three times the size of our hospital. <laughs> um, a little bit about more about Cherokee Nation, not just the health side of it. Our, our principal chief, Chuck Hoskin Jr. and our deputy principal chief, Brian Warner, uh, great leaders. They've been wonderful to work with and uh, they, they've been so instrumental in how we were able to respond during the pandemic. So, you know, e even during this time, we've been able to grow. 
We continue building houses, especially for what we our elders. Uh, we really feel that it's important to take care of our elders. A big piece of that is our language. You know, Cher the Cherokee language itself is one of the hardest languages to learn. And we have very few um, Cherokee citizens that can still speak uh, fluently. I, I wish I could. I can only say a few words like OCO, which means hello. And, uh, and you know, they've done a great job of being able to continue to support uh, transit systems, housing, healthcare, uh, water and sanitation. You, you go down the list as a sovereign nation, we're, we're much more than just a healthcare organization. So, all right. So um, we'll go a little bit of what I wanna talk about today's presentation is most of you probably have a good idea, the history of telehealth, telemedicine. Uh, in our experience during, during COVID, and I would say we, we were very lucky that we had been doing telemedicine uh, at Cherokee Nation and Indian Health uh, overall for, for many, many years. And uh, telepsychiatry, teleoptometry, teledentistry, we, we had some experience before we had to go into this, but there were, still were some challenges. And then, you know, where do we go from here? I, th I think that's the big question we're all talking about and thinking about and everybody's organizations, like what's this next step? So a little bit of the history and um, I, I, I love history and, and I love telehealth and, and it's just amazing to me some of the things that have occurred over the last hundred years or so. And, and if you look at maybe the film industry in comparison to the telehealth industry, there's some things I think that we can learn. Um, so in the late 1800s, right, we have things like the telegraph, the telephone, um, the film industry was all coming about all at the same time. And on the right there, you see the radio doctor that was actually called the teledactyl. Uh, a young German immigrant, Mr. Gernsbeck, had this idea of telehealth, telemedicine, back in around 1925, and he predicted that these devices would be in our homes by 1975. Everybody would be have access to this, right? It's 1975. How long ago is that? That's, that's almost 50 years ago now, the, the same amount of time it was from his prediction. So... Um, we've made some growth since then, but obviously not enough. The big piece to me in telehealth was the 60s, the late 60s and in the, in the 70s. You know, uh, you look at the Jetsons there. That, that was the idea. You know, there's a doctor looking, looking at, uh, I can't remember his name, but uh, it's one of the Jetson kids. And things like Star Trek, right, where, you know, you had the tricorder and you had it always amazed me, the screen would just pop up and they could talk to whomever they wanted to, right? He's sitting on the bridge and boom, there's a video conference. You didn't see some name of a video conference vendor, it just worked. Also in the late 60s and the early 70s, as a pioneer, the Indian Health Service, uh, working with NASA, was able to get remote diagnostics, actually transfer radiology images, to a uh, tribe that was really suffering in, in remote Arizona. Uh, they've changed their name a couple of times now. Uh, Tiago was, was one name, uh, but there, there's the van, there's the RV. I think that picture's from 1971. And I think that's, that's pretty neat. We, we still, I think many of us still have like emergency response vehicles that look very similar to that. Um, and, and most of Indian health now is, is we're still the same. We're very rural. Uh, the Cherokee Nation's lucky that Northeast Oklahoma is, is not as rural as say uh, North Dakota, Montana, Alaska, um, you know, Hawaii. Uh, you know, there, we support people in, in Puerto Rico and some of these other areas that we don't always think about as Americans. Um, and I gotta give a shout out to the Alaska group, uh, the Alaska Native Tribal Health uh, Consortium They've been doing telemedicine, you know, for a long time, and they they have some great programs and some great people uh, working in that. All right, I'm going to move along here. So back back to my comparison of film and telehealth, and, and something I think we should think about is, you know, competition really changed film. 
It, it started, you know, everybody went to the movies, right? You know, it was such a big thing of so many people's lives. And in, in the 50s, people started getting at home movie recorders and things of that nature. That didn't change much. And in, in the 60s and 70s, the film industry kind of stagnated. There wasn't any big change. People quit going to, to the movie theater as much because there wasn't anything really pushing them to do it. And then as, as the cost of creating films went down, you started seeing people create indie films. And, and so the big uh, film industry complex of, of MGM and all these started having low end competition. And, and then by the 2000s with the internet, we had things like Redbox, Netflix, video on demand, you know, kids are downloading movies and pirating movies left and right. Uh, so that, that group really didn't foresee the competition. They never were really scared. Uh, they, they thought that people would always continue to go to the movie theater. And next thing you know, you start seeing these huge companies like Blockbuster go out of business, right? Uh, in the retail industry, JC Penney's, uh, Toys R Us, this idea of brick and mortar versus remote access by people. Uh, I think we get very um, used to things and we think they're always going to be the same. And that's not really what's happening. So in, in healthcare, you know, we got to take into consideration what's the private sector? How, how's the healthcare delivery going to change? You have Amazon, Google, you know, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, they're all starting to change and do things differently. How is that going to affect us? Um, and will our healthcare organizations be able to adapt to that change in the same way that those quick technology companies can, right? They, they can make changes on the fly. For I would think for most of us, change takes, you know, like three to five years at the best and usually seven to 10 years in most of our organizations. I know um, we recently partnered with, with Oklahoma State University on a medical school. And I, I was uh, surprised to hear that curriculum changes, but it takes almost 10 years for that change to occur in, in, a, in a medical school, school environment. Um, really happy that they're working with us and I'm seeing the students and they're implementing all kinds of new technology and uh, hopefully they'll be able to take, uh, take care of some of the new oncoming changes. All right, so a little bit about what we did uh, during COVID. Uh, first of all, again, Chief Hoskin was amazing. Um, that was what I think stood out uh, more than technology was the strong leadership that we had. In, in, the, in, in our healthcare team. You know, Chief Hoskin was amazing in that he looked to us for direction and then he implemented it decisively. There was no, you know, he, he took the information and then made decisions. Um, and, you know, we're a public health driven organization and he included our public health team along with our clinical team. Uh, March 9th of last year, we started having calls every morning at seven and every evening at seven. So we had a lot of long days. And uh, up until about November, we did that every day of the week. And um, it, it, you know, it was very tiring, but it was great to be able to see how we could implement these changes quickly. And again, no, this is more than just our healthcare organization. We have schools, we have businesses. So we took what we were doing like screening um, we implemented um, the Abbott Binax, basically an at-home COVID test. We did that at our school so we could get the kids back into classes, right? So we could get uh, school functioning. We, we, they still had remote access and they did that as well. But a uh, big part of that, you know, parents wanted kids in school. So we had to figure out how to do that. Um, again, telehealth we had been doing, but it really had been uh, maybe an off-site provider, uh, telepsychiatrist, um, versus the way that we change to meeting the patient where they wanted to be. Um, as a CIO, often we become the CI no, right? We, we say, oh, you have to standard on this. You have to do this. And 
I had to take a big deep breath and just say, listen, we're gonna do what's best for our citizens. We're gonna do what's best for our patients. Uh, the federal government followed along not much after, and you saw the use of all kinds of technology. So I didn't just limit to, let's say Zoom. We were supporting almost 15 different types of access, um, you know, from doxy.me to Zoom to Skype to Cisco WebEx, just, just go down the list and uh, we, we just had to figure it out. The biggest challenge that we had was uh, in early April, we sent 2000 employees home. And yeah, that, that was, uh, we, we have a little over 3000 employees in our healthcare system. And so we're the biggest component of, of the Cherokee Nation. But most of those employees that we sent home had never worked from home. And a lot of that was back office employees. So while our providers really didn't struggle with telehealth, telemedicine, figuring out how to do things in the back office was an extreme challenge. We, we were still a very paper-based organization. Um, so now you're doing tele-registration, right? And, and tele-billing, and, which we don't really bill much. It has more to do with uh, uh, Medicare, Medicaid insurance. But those, those were extreme challenges. Um, we implemented a contact tracing system with our public health team uh, in coordination with Salesforce. We were the first tribe to use a, a customer relationship management contact tracing system. Luckily, we have a great epidemiology team and they, they were phenomenal in, in helping this out. And because we're such a large population in Oklahoma, we have to coordinate with the state of Oklahoma epidemiology team as well. So uh, we implemented a contact center. A uh, big change about that is we really weren't a centralized organization. We, we had been a decentralized where we allowed most of our clinics to kind of operate on their own. With, with the contact center, we centralized how you called in and scheduled appointments and things of that nature. A uh, big shout out to OSU. That is their medical school down that bottom left picture there. So, um, so new testing, we implemented all kinds of new testing. We did, uh, Dr. Mira ran our clinical trials from Reg, uh, Regernon to, I can't pronounce half the meds that he did clinical trials with, but it was amazing. I know, um, I had a friend, um, I, I got COVID and, and one of my close friends also had COVID around the same time. He got extremely sick and, and was placed in the hospital and uh, Bamlimab was, was the one of the transfusions that I know he was given. And it was amazing. Um, you know, he credits that for, for uh, his, his ability to recover. From a technology side, we implemented things like tablets, um, screening at every door, uh, e-signature, which for me was, was huge. I I'd had a huge push for years to lessen the paper that we were doing. And just, you know, Digital transformation in tribal health, at least, and I think healthcare in general has been a struggle uh, for many CIOs. But uh, COVID was probably did a better job than I ever could to get people to change the way that we were doing things. Drive throughs, oh, I, I, the mobile clinic setups, uh, you know, clinic in a box. That had been something we had talked about for years. We had one that we had prepared. Now all of a sudden I had to prepare 12 in a single day. You know, we, we, would, we would do mobile clinics at our uh, casinos and some of our other properties. And, you know, obviously they're not used to that. So, and, and, and then having the technology in place to make sure that our nurses and providers could, you know, give that care efficiently. And we still documented it, you know, in the past we probably would have done some type of paper chart but with the technology that we had in place, uh, our electronic health vendor is Cerner. They were a great help in, in getting things together. And then again, our team um, just did an amazing job. Um, our patient portal grew from around 12,000 at the beginning of COVID to over 50,000. Uh, a lot of that was because we finally opened up online scheduling. 
and we implemented things like, you know, short code, text, email notifications, and, and people obviously wanted to find out their COVID tests, but watching the growth of, of the portal uh, go from 12,000 to 50,000 in a blink of an eye was, was, was pretty amazing. We also create a citizens portal in cooperation with, with Salesforce uh, that helped us, you know, we talk about demographic information and I think every healthcare organization struggles with how do you keep up communication with your patients, right? The patient engagement side of, of healthcare and, and how we provide that care and um, it, it changed during COVID as well. We created a, a dashboard uh, public dashboard with Tableau and, and Salesforce that's out there uh, on the public Tableau site so we can make sure that the citizens and, and the overall general public uh, saw our data. And there's a picture of one of our drive throughs and one of the carts. I, I think we only had like 30 carts in, in, in at the beginning of COVID and now I think I have 300 carts and, and I love them and I hate them. <laughs> So with that, um, you know, I guess just kind of, again, we were lucky that we had been doing telehealth for a long time. And, you know, I, I don't have any just amazing, you know, hey, we implemented this technology. Um, we, we did um, move away and create a standard uh, telehealth platform with Cerner Amwell. Um, but still to this day, we still use Zoom. We still allow whatever the patient wants. You know, occasionally we'll come across a patient that doesn't want to use Zoom or doesn't want to do this or whatever it is, whatever that challenge is. The goal is to meet the patient where they want to be met because that's, that's where we are in consumer-based healthcare. And if you don't do that, they're going to go elsewhere. All right, the future of telehealth. Where do we go from here? For, for Indian health and tribal organizations, our number one barrier is reimbursement. Though um, tribal healthcare organizations can receive Medicaid, Medicare, and third-party uh, private insurance reimbursement, it's so different, right? There's across 50 states, there's 50 different ways that reimbursement works. And then because we receive federal funding, we have different laws with Medicare, Medicaid because we receive what's called a bundled rate. Um, that bundled rate can work for us sometimes, um, but for the most part, it's, it's becoming more and more of a barrier. Uh, things such as you, we had to have a face-to-face -face encounter before we could bill a telehealth visit. That is just, right? That's just crazy. Uh, and, and we were a little farther into COVID before we could even get that to change. And if you can't have a reimbursement, it really, uh, your health leadership is going to say, why are we doing telehealth if we can't bill for it? Uh, state laws for licensing of providers. Many tribal organizations like ourselves and the Navajo sit in a region where we have multi-state coverage. We have, so for us, we have people that come from Texas, Arkansas, Kansas. Um, we obviously have Cherokees living throughout the world. And um, we have a large contingent in both Florida and, and in California. My 72-year-old my uncle drove all the way from Orlando, Florida in January to uh, become one of the first Pfizer shots uh, in the Cherokee Nation. So um, we, we see patients wherever they, you know, however they want to be seen. And so again, laws, um, your state medical boards, those are some of the challenges that we have to get through. Acceptance and organizational change. That's, again, I was so happy. Um, I'm a Lean Six Sigma guy, and I, I came from a, a great organization that believed in, in project management, change management, those types of things. So workflows. It was amazing to see our nursing leadership and our physician leadership jump in with our IT team to talk about workflows. Before, you know, I just got the hand up, ah, whatever, you guys just go do that. Now we really had to talk and discuss and it created this fast paced organizational change. Um, I'm, I'm happy for it, but now I'm also scared to death because now everybody thinks that things can happen in like six weeks now. What, what used to take three years, 
was starting to change in four to six weeks. And my team's going to kill me if we stay on that pace. So um, I, I'm so happy to see the acceptance and change. But again, um, hopefully there has to be some uh, uh, halfway point in there where we can get through it. Uh, technology. In my mind, I, I don't know why we can't just have a vendor agnostic video. WebRTC is close, right? We can all click on a Zoom or Skype or whatever it is and open it up in our web browser. But it's still vendor dependent. I would love to have that Star Trek version of just video. Why, I, just want, I just want to connect to video. Uh, I, I don't know how many Android users we have on this call, but you know, uh, between Apple and Android texting and group messaging, it'll drive you nuts if, uh, if you don't uh, see the differences and all the different pop-ups. So hopefully at some point, you know, our, our cellular phone industry was the same way. In, in the early history of cellular phones, you could not talk across networks. And at some point, you know, those silly long distance commercials went away, right? Uh, there was no longer competition for the best sound or best quality. It was, it just worked. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to that. And, and maybe before, uh, sometime in our lifetime, that'll happen. Uh, inequity of certain populations. Obviously, I'm talking about Native Americans, but our rural Americans as well um, have the access to telehealth. Uh, the cost of that access is extreme. Um, we've seen so many uh, rural hospitals go under during COVID. And, and you know, that, that, that's scary when you think that, you know, some of our Indian health clinics, the next nearest healthcare organizations over a hundred miles away. And um, that, that's not a good place to be if you're already uh, economically strained and, and you know, rurally you, you can't get things like broadband. Uh, so hopefully I'm, I'm hoping that um, this administration, this federal administration will make some changes. We're, we're seeing large infrastructure packages um, that we're excited about. I, I placed on here the Center for Connected Health Policy. I've worked with them before. They had a great um, uh, booklet out there on your reimbursement policies. And it, again, you know, it, it's so different from state to state to state. I would love to see some standardization for telehealth. And for me, that's, that's my greatest barrier in, in what I work with um, uh, our congressional members to try to change. Um, 2019, telemedicine was a $46 billion industry. By 2020, it was an 80 billion. And by 2027, they're estimating 400 billion, which I think is very conservative at this point. But as you can see, that's, and, and, and that's just in the United States. If you start talking worldwide, it's much, much higher. I mentioned the rural hospitals. Over 137 have closed since 2010 and 179 have closed since 2005. And if you look at those areas, I think uh, everybody on this call is affected. Uh, you know, that, that, that's the Midwest, that's the Southeast part of uh, the United States, that, that's mass closings. And um, I think you also see our larger healthcare organizations and academic organizations uh, responding by partnering or, or collaborating with, with others um, you know, I, I mentioned Cerner. I know one of their large clients is Intermountain and, and how they've partnered with so many people. And the Cherokee Nation does things of that nature as well. Um, on the right there of that screen, you can see the $250 billion or 20% of all Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial uh, spending could be potentially virtualized. And you were starting to have a lot of large discussions with private uh, insurance in, in how, how, you know, they're, they're seeing that as well. There, there's a way to offset some of that cost. And I think that's gonna be a bigger push in the next three to five years. I mentioned, why can't video just work? That's again, that's just one of my big hangups and, and uh, burning over there, just sitting there staring at us, you know, that guy's everywhere now. So um, the new tech that is coming out, um, is amazing from artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, natural language processing. I have enough buzzwords. I can talk for an hour just in buzzwords. So um, machine learning and, and, and more. These are all things that we're implementing 
not just in our clinical care, but into our telehealth programs. Uh, with NLP and machine learning, you know, we talk about dictation. We think about having that Alexa in your office, right? Hearing you and your voice cues doing specific orders during that telehealth. So, so, you know, documentation, that burden that we have on our physicians slowly starts to go away. I love patient engagement. I love talking about how we can talk to our citizens and how do we give them information? Um, you know, tribal healthcare, you usually have a lot of disparate, uh, multi-chronic patients, you know, diabetes, cardiac issues. Um, so getting them more engaged into their healthcare is really a change not just for their patients, but also for our providers. Uh, you know, their, their idea of engagement is, well, they're in my office, that, that they're engaged. Uh, that's changed a little bit with another buzzword of the digital front door, right? Now we have access for our patients, be it a patient portal or online registration site, uh, online forms, right? There's so much paper, there's so much stuff we have to sign in healthcare. Um, why can't that all be online? And, and why can't you not ask me next time I walk in for the same document you asked me for two weeks ago? Um, that, that's, that's one of the big things that we've been able to push. Data analytics. Uh, I, one, one of another kind of buzz phrase here is the cognitive burden. Um, I'm very close friends with so many of our doctors. Uh, our, our, our CMIO, Dr. James Stalkup, we, we argue like brothers constantly and people will walk down the hall and hear us arguing at very loud high voices and, and just turn around and walk and go the other way. But we talk about the cognitive burden that's been placed upon our physicians. You know, as, as, as an IT person, I love data, but as a physician trying to consume all that data is such a struggle. And, and as a tribal healthcare organization, we may be responding to multiple grants and, you know, we have all these different services in our organization, behavioral health, dentistry, optometry. It's not just ambulatory care uh, when you come in to see your, your, your primary care provider. They have all this other information on the screen in front of them. And, and the burden, you can just see it on their face, right? Uh, my, my favorite thing right now is, is on Twitter is, is the med Twitter. Doctors just have no filter when they're upset. <laughs> and some of the things that they say about their EHR or their EMR or their IT team, it, it, it's kind of fun to, to look through med Twitter and, and see all that. But, but just to understand that there's a huge cognitive burden that's affecting our healthcare organizations and, and the teams that provide care to us, you know, they, they just want to provide care. Um, it's great. They have all of that information, but they weren't trained that way in medical school. So how do we slowly start getting all this data to actually work the way they want it to work? Um, if we could just read their minds, it'd be great. We're not there yet. And then, you know, consumer demand, meeting, meeting those patients where they want to be met. That's, that's the thing I'm, I'm talking to my leadership about the most is, you know, the thing, the thing that creates the most change is choice. And COVID has brought on choice to everybody's patient population, um, be it low cost choice, be it high brand name choice, customer service choice, best technology choice, whatever it is. I, I think we all know, you know, we don't typically go back to a bad restaurant, right? Um, or maybe you go to fast food because it's convenient. Wh whatever that is, it's your choice that you're making and healthcare now has more choice than ever. So with that, I want to say a wado, uh, which is thank you in Cherokee. Uh, appreciate you guys having me here today, and uh, I'm happy to field any questions. Well, wado to you, Donnie. Um, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, the Cherokee Nation is so fortunate to have you as their CIO. I can tell already um, that you are such a forward thinker that. Um, you know, that, that is fortunate for any healthcare industry to have that in, in their organization. So thank you. Um, what a great, great presentation. Okay, now I'm going to switch my view back to gallery so I can take a gander at everybody and uh, see if we have any questions from our participants. Rachel. 
Hi, Donnie. Um, thank you for your talk. It was really wonderful and informative. My question for you it has to do with the, the broadband um, in, in the tribal areas. I know that in Missouri, we have struggled during COVID with telemedicine being able to go directly in the home for the first time and be paid for. We have struggled with um, lots of folks who do not have adequate or affordable broadband so that they could utilize the technology. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great, I, I typically don't list it on my barriers anymore because broadband is growing, but we all still know, especially in rural parts of, of America, broadband's a big, big issue. Cherokee Nation, we, we create a program called Cherokee Connect. We actually bought Spectrum from the FCC. So we're doing all kinds of wireless projects. Every single one of our properties has free Wi-Fi in our parking lots. Uh, I think that's a first step. I would love to get uh, free broadband to all of our citizens. And some tribes can do that. So, so some of the smaller tribes have been able to get grants or, or self-fund things, and they do provide or, or pay for um, uh, broadband to their citizens. Right now, um, I think one of the bigger things we all can do is talk to our um, congressional representatives about what broadband means to us. To me, it's a utility that should be funded and taken care of across the United States. Thank you, Donnie. What other questions do we have? Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Um, Donnie, great talk. Uh, outstanding question you. for you. Um, have you found that technology uh, and culture uh, on the reservations uh, or culture could be a, a barrier to adopting technology on reservations? Looking at telehealth, that's something that we had heard in one of the conversations we had with Michael Tote of IHS. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Tote. Yeah. yeah, he's a great, a great guy. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you know, initially, 10 years ago, I definitely would have told you yes, right? Today, not so much. I, I, I see seniors, you know, 80, 85 years old with, with smartphones. And, you know, that's, that's how they connect to family. Um, that's how they, everything, everything in their life is being pushed that way. And, and there's some that don't want it, right? We still have very many, many that want to live um, a, a different lifestyle. But for the most part, um, the younger generation, obviously, from school to, you know, their friends, how they interact with technology, that's just part of life now. Um, so we don't see that being a barrier. Uh, I, I really was surprised in the 65 and older. That uses that use smartphones. It it is uh, it, from the patient portal. We have all this information, and you know it's like ninety five percent of them are using a smartphone. Uh, we used to make jokes about the flip phone, right? But uh, it, we're not seeing that being as big as Barry. Now access to that, right? The cost that is that is the bear. The use of it, the understanding of it, the adoption of it. I, I don't see that as the struggle now. It really is that cost. Uh, getting broadband to certain areas. Um, I know uh, when I built uh, my last house, it was $25,000 is what they wanted me to pay to get a hundred yards of, uh, uh, you know, DSL cable to my house, which is just ridiculous. Right. So um, yeah, I, I think we're, I think we're making much better headway. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Donnie, I'll ask, this was just a fantastic presentation. Um, I'm on the behavioral health side of, of things. So yeah. I just wondered how you saw adoption in some of the telebehavioral health service um, and related. Thank you, Eva. Yeah, great question. Um, luckily, we've been doing telepsychiatry for uh, almost 12 years and you know group therapies all, all these different things remotely um, we, we it, it's grown and it's only been better for us um, obviously you know addiction and, and some of the other behavioral health issues grew during covid uh, depression 
Um, we, we had a lot of different ways of trying to not only do telehealth, but implement um, things like a chat bot, right? Where a person could speak to it if they didn't have access to speak to uh, a human and, and, and taking cues of, okay, they're asking questions. Do you, do you give the 800 to the national suicide hotline and things of that nature? Um, so our telehealth and tele telebehavioral health services grew and our leader, uh, her name is Julie Skinner, Dr. Julie Skinner. She's great. And she just pushes me every day for more access to tech. So um, we, we've been quite happy with it. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Chris. Hi, I'm a retired physician in uh, Lawrence, Kansas. I have a relative who is a Native American and he uh, espouses some reluctance to get vaccination. And I wondered how you're approaching that kind of resistance amongst uh, Native Americans. Thanks, Chris. That 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 is Dr. Ellis. That's a great question. We we've been struggling with it, especially in the most rural parts of our our uh, reservation, in the rural parts of of Oklahoma. You know, I think we went about it the way uh, everybody else did. Lot lots of media, you know, online media, which really doesn't even reach those folks. Most of them don't want to pay attention to, to Facebook, Twitter, or if they do pay attention to Facebook, it's really not the stuff that you want them to pay attention to. So um, luckily we, we did a lot of paper media. Um, we go out to schools, we go out to churches, our public health team, um, you know, tries to have these discussions uh, internally, um, you know, like, like myself, it, when I got my shot, here's, you know, here's Donnie Parrish getting his shot. And we, we did a lot of those kind of internal things because a lot of our employees uh, were even reluctant um, to, to get the shot. Our native speakers, and I, I mentioned this, we have about 2,000 over the age of 65 that are considered fluent native speakers. We vaccinated them first. That was our primary goal is to save our language and, and to save those elders, protect those elders. We did a lot of uh, both media in taking them with us out and large to the public to have just open discussions. You know, what, what's the fear? Um, you know, historically, uh, Native Americans have had some bad outcomes when it comes to um, certain diseases and, and, and how governments have, have treated Native Americans in, in you know, a, you just had to realize that that was in the past. Uh, this is a safe thing. Uh, the vaccine is safe and, and uh, just try to push that, that thought as much as possible. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I, can't, I can't resist. I appreciate the presentation so much, Donnie, and uh, your response to the question. As a follow-up to Chris's question, um, and, you know, it's, it's just a daily moving target with new information. And I know each of our locations gets different vaccines. It's, it seems like just when we're making some headway, <laughs> there comes out something different about one of the specific vaccines. So uh, is, I assume the answer is it's just an ongoing thing as, as new information comes out and continue to try to get that message across uh, that you know, overall it's safe. Um, and I, I think that applies to all of us, not just in, in your population, but any follow-up thoughts on that? Yeah, so one of the things that we did for the first time in our history is we opened up to, to what we call non-beneficiaries, right? Non-Native Americans. So anybody, the state of Oklahoma was struggling a bit to get vaccinations out. And it, not just Cherokee Nation, almost every tribe in Oklahoma said, hey, if you want a vaccination, come see us. We, 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 you know, we have plenty in stock and to your point, we have Pfizer, Moderna, Janssen, Johnson, Johnson, whatever, whatever, pick your poison. <laughs> and, you know, some people want the one shot uh, versus the, the, the multiple shots. Um, and just like you said, every time new information came out, Chief Hoskin did a great job of saying, listen, you know, when, when we talk about science, you, you want to say science isn't perfect, but that it changes as data comes in, as information comes in, we may change how we do something. 
uh, you know, temperatures. Screening was so big a year ago at all of our facilities. Now, you know, you look at it and go, ah, you know, them having a fever and screening them, is that, is that such a big deal anymore? You know, all the doctors, you know, it's, it's not as important. So we openly have those conversations. I think, you know, every time we see something posted in social media, we try to respond back. Uh, we get a lot of questions. We have a lot of discussions. I, I think our elected leadership does a great job of trying to go out to the public and just answer those questions as, as often as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Other questions? Well, Donnie, what a great uh, Tuesday morning. I'm so happy that you were able to share your time with us and uh, provide this information that um, often that we don't get you know, uh, about our, our tribal health and, and um, what a great uh, resource you are for the Cherokee Nation. So once again, thank you so much uh, for your time and your talents. And uh, don't be a stranger. You can join our telemedicine echoes anytime. If you have time, it sounds like <laughs> you're very busy. Um, but anyway, just want to thank everyone. Next uh, month, we have a patient's perspective on um, this calendar. And so we will uh, be talking about that. And today, uh, I just want you to go out and make it a great day. You guys are great. Thank you so much for joining.